I'm Tom Ray, and this is my art podcast. On this episode of the podcast, I get the chance to meet... My name is Martel Chapman, and I uh, paint with jazz music influence. My early years of memory are on a small town of around 700 Bloomington, Wisconsin, where I remember my first drawings and everything. Superheroes out of comic books, and then got older and it was sports and then took art seriously after I heard jazz. Really? Why was that? John Coltrane was the was a musician, you know, he's a musician saxophonist and he was referenced to being a, an artist and before that I had only recognized an artist as something visual. I wanted to understand how a musician could become an artist. So from that day forward I tried to have been trying to investigate that link to what sound might be visually mm -hmm. and that's how I've been applying that effort since. Like what kind of drawing styles did you start out with? It was comic books and uh, Sal Buscema who did the May, um, most of Marvel's Hulk in the 70s yeah. and then Mad Magazine's Jack Davis. Loved that guy. Yeah. I still, you know, I would copy him out of the Mad Magazine all the time with, you know, E.T with a hangover and an ice pack on his head. There's, you know, they would, this, and the, the, the comedy in it and everything else. Uh, so it was, you know, it was, and then that, you know, then I would do characters of classmates and still do, to this day, coworkers. It's a lot of fun. And so I'm always got, I always have something going on in my head that I see and I want to transfer into a, a visual form, you know. But like I said, it progressed into, into, you know, taking it seriously through jazz music. Right when I heard the opening tune to Blue Train, it, it struck me and, once you get further into the music, you know, there's, what I was listening to, they didn't have any words, but they're putting words as titles. So then you're interested, well, the, the title is this, mm -hmm. how are you coming up with this sound and then labeling it that? Mm -hmm. I know there's standards that I'll have, and they just become, you know, instead of a vocal rendition, it becomes a, you just, a, a non-vocal rendition. But that, that's always been the interesting part of just opening your mind to how are they getting to it? Because if they're singing you a song, the lyrics are there, the song title is there in words, so you don't have to think too hard. Yeah. They're telling you a story, and they're telling you their story, and that's that. But when they do it with just sound, then, it's, then it gives the listener a reason to look further into it, because the emotion of the sound might be different from the sound of the word. Mm -hmm. So that's where, I, that's where I'm kind of like, I'm like hovering around every time I'm, you know, painting or thinking about what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Like that's, it's not like, a, it's not, I don't have to like listen to one song and that's what I'm going to paint today because it's going to influence me and grab me that way. It's just an ongoing thing. Like it's a cloud of influence around me. Like, well, this might look like this. That sound might look like this. Mm -hmm. And then it makes sense in that way. So that's always been you know, like whatever I'm doing, it's, it's geometric based on math, based on sound mm -hmm. and interpreting it loosely without there's a little bit of science behind it but it's not there it's it's interpretive as well mm -hmm. so there's some freedom inside of that there's always my early influence with, with with comic books and superheroes into athletics i could do this but nobody else around me was doing it mm -hmm. so i felt isolated if i was so i'd kind of dismiss it and try to step away from it right mm -hmm. you know you, you, you're middle school and high school you're trying to fit into these things and you're trying to fit in everybody around you and i wasn't i didn't have anybody around me that i could connect with so I kind of dismissed it for a while, and I only took a, a drawing class as an elective in, in my sophomore year after not even drawing for probably for two years, yeah. just because I had to fill electives. And once I did that, great teacher at Madison East. So you actually went to high school in Madison? Yeah. Okay. Northeast side, Warner Park area, and then Madison East is where I went to high school, and um, Mr. Berger was the art instructor there. That just really easy approach to what you're trying to do. It was always, and it stays with me, no draw the... Don't draw the object, draw the shapes that make the object. So that is always in the back of my head every time. It makes it easier to understand what you're looking at. Break it all down. So that works with what I'm doing now. So, but my sophomore year there, I, I realized I was doing stuff while well, I, I like what I'm doing. A lot of the athletes that were being drawn and influences like Merv Corning, who did a lot of watercolors of NFL players and everything. Um, so I, I was, after Jack Davis, Merv Corning was a big influence, mm -hmm. right? So I started to kind of emulate what he was trying to do. And it was, you know, pencil it was really basic number two pencil on on like a uh, poster board that I really liked I liked the dark contrasts but things developed in a way that surprised me and so I stayed with it 
through high school and then tried METC's commercial art program, but it wasn't what I expected, so I, I didn't want to waste the time and money if I, my heart wasn't into it, and I wasn't ready for school anyway, so I just dropped it after a week and right. took general studies and got a factory job for six years and been bouncing around types of warehouse labor for ever since, and this is, it was 97 when jazz, like, so how did you discover it? Were you listening to it beforehand? Or, I mean, like, what, did you, what kind of music did you grow up on? Uh, my first memory was, uh, like, Sundays was cleaning, were cleaning the trailer day. We lived on a trailer on my, mom, my grandma and grandpa's farm lot. Mm -hmm. And Sundays were my mom and dad's reel-to-reel -reel tapes of, like, Temptations. Mm -hmm. and, and, our, and they did it reel-to-reel -reel style, huh? Reel-to-reel. -reel. I remember they, it was on a wall and the green and, and gray. The green was like a felt with, with fake nice. gray wood. And then they pop them on there, so I can, that was like my first memory of, okay. of, of music. And, and even that memory right now, it's like yesterday, it was heavy sound, and it was, but it, but it was always that way. So I always, we always had music playing, it was whatever. You know, like in the 80s, you know, Motley Crue, Iron Maiden, and then I got into uh, hip hop, and then the jazz samples always kind of perked my ears up. Mm -hmm. It would sample out of the guys and Blue Note labels from the 50s and 60s. So I always kept those trumpeters and pianists in mind because you'd hear those horns and keys play. Yeah. And then uh, I tried to get into jazz a little too soon. And I, it was a Coltrane tape, and I couldn't even get through a song because it was like, well, I don't, I don't think I can listen to 10 minutes of, of a quartet here. <laughs> I'm used to like a segment in a loop. And I loved that, and then that recreated. So I'm like, well, I'll just stick to hip hop for a while. And then and then um, got into Marvin Gaye and Curtis Mayfield after hip hop, kind of you know, like late 90s, it, it, it changed too much for me. I like the mid 90s hip hop was really good. Right. So I was just going through record store one day and I saw that, that cover of Blue Train where Coltrane's got, he's, yeah. he's holding his chin, he's, and but that, ba -da 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 -da, boom, boom. Right, I, that was all I heard and I kept backing it up that yeah. afternoon to work that day. I'm like, it was yeah. shaking and it was amazing. And that, so that was, that was what, like, tuned me in, huh. right there. So I've been trying to give back ever since. How did you end up turning to painting instead of just drawing? From drawing and then into watercolor painting, and then it got... Which isn't easy either. It isn't. That's a very, that is a very tight discipline. Yeah. Well, that's why I love oil painting so much, because I can just grind it out. I don't care. I don't even look at it as any missteps or mistakes. I'm just, I'm just, not, just not done yet. I'm just going to keep grinding it through until I'll be satisfied. It lives a little bit, and you can just keep moving it around. Music struck me to a point where I wanted to convey their significance in a larger scale. So instead of drawing something with a number two pencil on something larger than 11 by 14 sheet, well, I got to give them a little more space, a little more uh, recognition. So I got canvas, tried acrylic paint for a while, and that was. But oil paint was right there. I'm, I'm, I never, I haven't gone back to acrylic. I think I went acrylic painting, exploring. You know, it was related to watercolor, but got into oil after maybe a year of acrylic painting, and then that's that's what I'm doing. It's that's the whole idea. So when did you start? I mean, you don't just pick up a paintbrush and like this is how I paint now. Like, how did your style evolve? Yeah. So like after I was, you know, painting them to put them up on my walls to give them the respect I think they deserve. Jazz musicians and any other musician is about individuality, so I didn't want to sit there and think I'm not going to reproduce a photograph for the rest of my life here, right? right. So what have I learned then? You know, if I, can, if I can knock out a portrait off a photograph, okay, fine. That's a nice technique and skill set to work off of, right? Good, sharpen your skills. Well, have I learned anything from what I'm listening to? So I started to look into that. And if it's based, if I'm trying to figure out what the sound looks like and it comes down to that, and I relate it a lot like a rectangle. I will take a rectangle and I think that's what a sound is. Mm -hmm. And depending on the type of sound is gonna depict a little bit of the color. But the color isn't as important to me, it's more than form. So when I, when I listen to music, it's forms that I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. not, a, not colors, just depth and shadows for sure. So it lends itself, it does lend itself to cubism, there's no doubt. Mm -hmm. And I like the fact that they are interpretive, especially analytical cubism where you know, I think they were painting it and people would look at it, it's like looking through a broken piece of glass. Sure, but I'm looking at it as more of a, well, maybe that's the idea of what it should look like if you built it. If you had 
30 pieces of 30 different shapes and sizes of rectangles. And they said, can you build me um, David versus Goliath with these pieces? OK, I'll try. So you can manipulate the shapes to give you an idea of a face, an idea of a bust, an idea of a hand with those shapes, which is, to me, the equivalent of just taking basic sounds. What can you do with these sounds? Like, what I wonder of what musicians do. Because a note is a note. Then the next note makes it an interplay of sound. So that's what I'm trying to convey visually. You know, if I was to paint a song, it would be, it would take me like probably the rest of my life. But I can take maybe a note or two, and I might be able to paint that onto a canvas that's, you know, 16 by 20. With jazz, I pay attention. If it's a quartet, you're listening to all the musicians playing at the same time, but your mind can focus on what you want to listen to. And it's still there, right? So it's shifting. So if you're, if you're facing a stage and the saxophonist is in the front, the trumpeter is behind him if it's a quintet, then the piano, drum, and bass, and they're all kind of like in line, well, your ears can maybe shift them around. Mm -hmm. okay, so that's in play too when I'm painting. And some of my paintings will have, if, if the bassist is behind the pianist, well, there's a line that's gonna come through the basis, then it's going to look like it's carving into the pianist mm -hmm. because you're showing that three-dimensional idea of that sound blending together, mm -hmm. like they're in unison. So that's the same concept as well that I try to capture every now and then. More of the show after this break. You know, I'm spending nine hours a day in a warehouse and something come to mind and I got a pen, I'm gonna draw it out. So I'll have maybe a dozen um, sketches of that in my head for a few days before I got time to get in the studio and start painting it. Okay. So then I'll have them kind of laid out in front of me to remind myself of what I wanted to do after I come to a conclusion mm -hmm. of where to go with it. The same form repeated 12 different ways on 12 different sketches and then you take those and they end up kind of blending together as you go and things change too, right? So it's cool with paint, something will happen, I'm gonna keep that. Mm -hmm. And then and that, but that one thing is really nice. Everything else is meh, and you'll end up. Well, I'm going to incorporate this one spot. Got to redo the whole piece because this one little spot looks better mm -hmm. than 90% of the painting. But I'm going to rework the whole thing just for that one little spot. Yep. So those are the like so. So you're 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 freezing all of your ideas at the same time. Bam, here they are. Yeah. And let's go now. Like you're 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 keeping your ideas in check right in front of you. When did you start displaying them or trying to show them places? Uh, early 2000s coffee shops. Uh, and Cora was really nice. They, I, did a, I did a few shows there on Monroe Street. That was the first place you did at, was Ancora. Okay, and then how did you approach them to, I mean, did you just walk up, or like, how did you submit your stuff there? Yeah, just asked. Uh, okay. You know, you see other people's art, and you, you guys are uh, interested in putting mine up, and they are, they aren't, or they're not. When was the defining moment where you're like, okay, I'm ready? Like my wife would say, you should put stuff up here, and I'm like, oh, okay. Uh -huh. And then, then maybe, and then, then cool, and then... And like, like here, too, at Waypoint, it's nice because they're just up. This idea is, is, works really well for me, so I can come in, I'm short distance away, hang out, look at my stuff, it's here, and it's up, and I'm sharing it. You know, you know it's, it's beyond the grand, your grandmother's refrigerator, which is nice. <laughs> but you never know, you know, as long as it makes grandma's cut, you're good. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. No, there isn't, <laughs> right. But now it's like, well... Grandma loves my work, I know, but uh, this is everybody else, so you don't know. How did you find this place? Um, when we're nearby and live in McFarland, so we're close. And I got to know a lot of the Joe and Patrick and other bartenders here, so it's a really cool place, a really cool hangout. So I've been up here since September. I heard about you through Triangulator. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did you guys meet? Lou is a barber downtown, and he came across my work through an old co-worker who was cutting his hair and they started talking about jazz and then he gave who uh, I was to Lou and I met Lou and he bought a piece and then Lou I think maybe cut Triangulator's hair okay. and they started talking so I met Triangulator and met, went to his place and hung out and looked at all of his his vast amount of work yeah. outside of what he does outside you know I mean I don't, I don't know when he sleeps yeah. And they're so active, they vibrate. Uh -huh. So that's how I came across them. We hung out for an afternoon and talked about things. So in the future, we're going to 
collaborate on some things. Because if you look at what he does, his shapes are a specific style, mm -hmm. and mine are angular and, sh and, and right angled. So it'd be, I want to see what we can, if him and I get together and blend what we're doing, yeah. it'd be really interesting yeah. to see what we come up with. Every now and then we'll, we'll, we'll shoot each other a text or two on ideas or perspectives. If he drops something and if something hits me in words, I say, well, what it does, you know, what it might do, if you, and I talk about a thesaurus, because I'll, I'll use a thesaurus describing some of the, you know, how many times can you, can you use the word line? Right. Because, so, and then you find, well, these are delineations and all these other things. So that, then it opens your mind more to what else you could do visually. It'll trigger something a little bit more of an influence. Yeah. If I look back at the original sketch that I did, that's not even on the canvas anymore, like, well, that's where it's truly being born, right? That's where it's alive still. Mm -hmm. you, know, you haven't just, you haven't stopped it and solidified it in, in paint. It's still here with all these other possibilities in front of you, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And the same concept too, like I, I like when I see a, a poet or a writer's rough draft of whatever they're writing, if it's one page and you yes. see everything's cross out and the arrows are up and down, mm -hmm. that's the mind. They're freezing the human mind in its process. Yeah. So you can actually take a buck take a step back and look at, well, that's how the mind is thinking. That's the snapshot of it. And that's kind of what I'm, bronze monk, it's the idea of sculpture in the process in relation to composing a musical piece at the same time. I wanted to ask about some artwork you did on a book. Brilliant Corners is a publication out of a college in Pennsylvania. It's a poetry, literature, jazz literature publication twice a year. And I remember worked, I worked at Barnes & Noble a long time ago and I remember seeing it, Brilliant Corners is the name of a Thelonious Monk song. So I was like drawn to it. But you know, I was, it was beyond me at the time. Um, but a couple months ago, a publisher reached out and asked to use one of my paintings for their cover. They reached out to you? Yeah. How did they find it? I'm not even sure how. You didn't even ask, it would have been the first I thing I asked. I have before. <laughs> And sometimes they, uh, I don't know, it just you know, sounded like, oh, I'm not gonna. But yeah, that was great. That was, yeah, fine. And it was cool that I, I remembered the publication from like 20 years ago. Yeah. And here it is, there it is. Um, like, same thing too, I've done jazz album covers. I mean, that's, I'm good. That's, all, that's what I want to do. And uh, there was a pianist out of Brooklyn, Victor Gold, um, four years ago, out of the blue, emailed me, I want to do, I want you to do my cover for me. And he was on tour in Greece at the time. So I said, okay, let's do this. And he said, I like what you do, just do whatever. So I started a piece and modern technology, I can text him a image while I'm sitting there at the easel. What do you think? We, we can go back and forth on it within minutes while he's on tour on the side of the world. And yeah. that's how that occurred. And so I've done two album covers for him since. Wow. Yeah, and that's like, you know, I remember as a kid, I'd draw cassettes for mixtapes, right? Right, yeah. But I would draw them in the smallest, just so I could cut them out and then fit them into the plastic case of the cassette. Yeah. I was doing that forever. Oh, wow, and then, so, uh, how do you put your stuff out there then, if these people are finding you? Like, is it just through, like, Instagram and things like that? Fine Art, Fine Art America, that's where I can sell prints. You can, you can put my painting on a duvet cover if you'd like. They'll print it up for you. And then I get a cut. I just give them a, send them the image. Okay. If it's a large enough scale, whatever quality print, from the image, that's what you get. Huh. Coffee mugs, t-shirts, um, metal prints, whatever. So, yeah. And do you promote yourself at all? or? It's, I don't really know how to, other uh, than, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So it just, this is good, talking to you about what I'm doing. It's private, it feels private, right? Yeah. And it's easy that way. I'm not a salesman, right. so it's like. Uh, it's a fine line, it's really hard. It's. A, I can explain somebody else's stuff yeah. like yeah, nobody's business, and then what about mine? It's like, I don't know. Right, I want my grandma to promote my stuff. <laughs> that actually is a brilliant idea. I kind of like that. Yes. Okay. It's hard, too, because you'll see stuff where people have it out there, and, and they're like, I don't know what I did. And you even kind of said that. You're like, I don't even know how that guy found me. And it can happen like that sometime, too. But then it's also, it's good to hear that stuff because that way people don't think like, oh, he doesn't even have to try. And it's like, no, it was a complete accident. And it happens to everyone. Mm -hmm. What kind of opportunities have you gotten from this? Or is there anything that you've learned from meeting these people? So I, I'm still doing this with you today. Um, yeah. the, the, our, up, up here since September, yeah. a guy in Kuwait bought 
six pieces from me. When people just somehow come across it, then you know it's genuine. Mm -hmm. Like you're not trying to like convince them. Don't, you, know, they don't, you don't have to. They see it, they, it resonates, and bam. So I'm trying to stay on that, that inspiration. I'm just trying to stay on that. So since Lou bought that piece from me, meeting Triangulator, talking to you, the buyer in, in, in Kuwait has kind of like, okay, I have you know, confidence now. I'll show my work here now. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I've sold a couple of pieces here since they've been up. But it's like you need that. As much as you think that it's good, or as much as you, you sit there and I'll look at my, my stuff, sometimes like, oh, what am I doing? Right. You know? Because I'm still doing, I'm still, you know, made, pay, paying bills, doing warehouse work. Mm-hmm. But when these things do come up, it's, it is, it, it's, it's nice. Yeah. Like the, the, my brother in Kuwait that bought the piece, the six pieces were very important to me too. They were like, I want these. I want to keep these. Well, somebody else appreciated as much as I did and... Well, they're his now. They have to be that way, right? Yeah. That's, that's, that's the whole sharing process. Yeah. I hate to use the word term networking, but it's the perfect word, you know, but, but it's more networking in the sense of like a network of friends. Like you're, you're building relationships in the art community, and I think that's pretty awesome. Right. And it was all just because of a barber. Right. <laughs> I think it just kind of like tweaked the universe a little bit, not to sound that way, but it yeah. kind of like sparked a positive energy. What are some of the difficulties about uh, just doing this? Just the time. Yeah. That's the, I mean, having enough time in the day to do it. Because I stayed home with my daughter for her first six years, and then I'd stay up late and paint. That's where I did most of my work. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that's been, go- is now has sold. And so I had more time then. But I'm slowly getting back. Like, I would have three to four pieces working at the same time. And after a while, they would all wrap up within a day. I'd get four finished and then move on to the next. So I'd have in the different types of disciplines too, a straight portrait one, an abstract one, and something more linear or whatever. Yeah. So I'll be able to kind of exercise my approaches in various ways all at once. I could stop this one, go to this one, go to this one, go to that one. So it was keeping it active. So I couldn't help myself but to stay in the ease, stay at the easel and everything else. So now it's just, I've got to get that time in more often. Mm-hmm. Got to find that time. And I know I think a lot of artists I've talked to, too, you know how much this is your idea. You know how long that's going to take you, right? Mm-hmm. You can sit there and, well, if I, it's too late. If I start now, get everything going, it'll take me an hour to get everything set up, and all of a sudden, oh, now I'm exhausted. I, what do you do to, I mean, what is your current setup for finding the time? Some commissions, so like, okay, I'm kind of prodded. i got to get in here and do it. If they pay me up front, i got to get in there. I've, I've gotta, I'm obligated to do it now, so that'll, that'll get me going. And once I'm there, then the other ideas are starting to kind of like come back up and then mm-hmm. I then I can start going because I'll have like right now I got three that I'm in the works of doing okay. so an album cover for local hip hop rambunctious music and uh, every day for their album cover the Archangel Michael for a lady out east and abstract 67 Mustang okay so I got I got stuff I'm working I just yeah get, get in there and then go. You know, I need like a good five hour block to feel like I've done something. Something that just occurred to me, it's like, I'm assuming you're painting them, right? Mm -hmm. You don't normally hear of people painting album covers anymore. That used to be the norm. And then it was like, okay, now you can do photographs. And then it was graphic design. They're gonna get the painting and be able to use it as an album? Yeah, that's that's been so, Victor Gold, the pianist out east, Sean O'Brien Smith, I've done two for his, his projects. And yeah, they get the, the deal is they get the original and then I'll do, I can do the graphic design work as well if they use it. And I've done that for three of the four. I think that's a cool idea, right? Yeah. Don't you think? I mean, they get the original piece, hang that up and there's the, the whole thing. You get, and it's on the cover and that's, everybody loves album covers, especially now the resurgence of LPs are out. So if I get that, if I can see one of mine on a vinyl, then I can move on. I, I, I achieve that. Or if I can just do that all the time, obviously. Right. I was going to say, not move on. You'd want to do it again. Doing it. Uh, yeah. Right. You know, down the road, I think I'd like to do, get commissioned for portraits just for anybody. Yeah. You know, in, the, in my, in, you know, if they appreciate my approach, then it would work. I mean, that's, I think, ideally, that's, if I can't do an album cover work on a regular, regular basis, I think finding people that would want them, them done or somebody they love done or, whatever else. To learn 
more about Martell, you can find him on Facebook at facebook.com slash martell.chapman. The music for this episode is by my band Lorenzo's Music at lorenzosmusic.com. I'll see you next week. So until then, so long. Thank you.